Welcome to part five of the Great War. Now we're gonna take a look at the Global War. Now we need to keep in mind that this is actually a global war. It didn't just take place in Western Europe, right? It was a global confrontation. I already mentioned that Japan got involved very early in the war. They declared war on Germany. Why would they do that? Well, because the Germans had uh, possessions in the Pacific that they wanted. They had the German Mandate Islands, the Marianas chain with, chain with the exception of uh, Guam. They will quickly take those over. Its sphere of influence in China there at the Shandong Peninsula in the city of Tsingtao, they're going to invade that and take that over, right? Take over that sphere of influence. Ultimately, they're going to force the Chinese government, which was in turmoil because the Qing dynasty had collapsed, to um, sign a, a series of agreements known as the 21 Demands, right? Uh, in Eastern Europe, you're going to have confrontation. Like, for example, Russia is going to be invaded by the Ottomans, and that invasion by the Ottomans is going to stagnate, and the Russians are going to counter-invade, and they're going to begin pushing into the Ottoman Empire, right? Ultimately, when those lines stabilize, uh, the uh, Turkish uh, uh, leaders of the Ottoman Empire are going to blame this on the Armenians living in the northern part of their country. They're going to say it was clearly the Armenians who aided and abetted the Russians, or this would not have happened. And what it led to was what's known as the Armenian Genocide, right? The, uh, the Ottomans uh, began moving and relocating the uh, Armenians into concentration camps, moving them away from the Russian lines, uh, and they began literally starving them out and killing them. Somewhere around 1.5 million Armenians are going to die during the war, most of them of starvation. This picture you see here at the top, that's uh, actually an a Ottoman official teasing a group of starving uh, Armenian uh, uh, kids with a sandwich. He's holding a sandwich up over their head, right? Uh, there's also going to be turmoil in the Middle East, right, in Arabia. Uh, you're going to have, uh, again, this is an area that's under the control of the Ottomans, but the British are going to send people there uh, to try and get the different uh, Arab uh, uh, groups to rise up in rebellion against Ottoman rule, right? So the results, uh, the results of this is that the Allies, the Triple Entente, as the Western powers were called, will ultimate, ultimately occupy Iraq and Syria, uh, Jordan, Palestine, and Western Arabia, which is part of modern Saudi Arabia, including the city of Mecca, right? By the end of the war, Britain will have mandates over Iraq, Transjordan, and Palestine. France will receive a mandate over Syria and Lebanon. Right, Iran will be carved out of the Ottoman Empire, and the uh, the rule of Iran will be shifted to a man named Reza Shah Pahlavi. Right, and a man by Ibn Saud would take care uh, take over the Arabian Peninsula, and he would establish the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as a result of this. You're also going to have a lot of anti-colonial uh, uh, revolts during this time. You're going to have a lot of these nations that were already part of that European imperialism in Asia and Africa decide this would be a good time for us to try and get our independence, right? So again, for example, in May of 1916, a 16-year-old king of Vietnam by the name of Doi Tan is going to attempt a revolt to uh, depose uh, French rule in French Indochina, right? Uh, he'll be defeated and sent into exile. Right. In British uh, Miss Island, uh, which is today called Malawi, uh, an American trained Baptist min minister named John Chilawambe is going to lead an anti colonial re uh, revolt against the British. And, uh, and again, that it's going to fail. He's going to be captured and killed by British uh, colonial troops. Right. Um, you're also going to actually have. Uh, global combat. You're going to actually have British and German and other forces fighting each other in these colonial uh, regions. For example, in 1914, the British will invade German East Africa. On November 7th, uh, 1914, the Japanese would capture that city of Tsingtao I mentioned before. On April 25th, 1915, the British are going to begin their ill-fated attack on, uh, on the Ottoman Empire at a place called Gallipoli, right, where the conditions were so bad and the that uh, as one uh, uh, British soldier described it, just in order to eat, the flies were so thick because of the dead and decaying that uh, in order to eat, you had to develop this method. You take your bread and literally flick your wrist and put it straight to your mouth. If you didn't do this motion, you would usually eat a mouthful of flies in the process of just trying to get a bite of bread, right? Um, 
independence movements would fester and grow in places like India and the Philippines and even in Ireland, right? After, the, uh, uh, after World War I, you're going to have an Irish Civil War. Of course, the largest uh, uh, nationalistic uprising is going to take place in Russia and ultimately is going to lead to the Russian Revolution, right? Uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the guy you see uh, pictured here, was a political exile. He was living in Zurich, um, but he will return to Petrograd in 1917 to lead an uprising against the Tsars. He's going to lead a group called the Bolsheviks, right? Uh, the military ultimately will turn against the Tsar. The Tsar is going to try and lead from the front, and that's not going to work out very well because he's not very good at leading troops. Right? And the result of this is that on March 15, 1917, Nicholas Tsar II is going to have to abdicate, abdicate the throne. Right, He's going to be kicked out of power. And he's going to be replaced by a provis provisional government, a provisional government that's actually going to be supported by the Western powers of Britain, France, and the United States. Right, But the tensions are going to continue to uh, rise because uh, that provisional government is going to be led by a man named Alexander Kerensky, and he is going to elect to continue the war. Well, the people wanted this overthrow of the Tsar so that they could sue for peace, get out of the war. Well, that, of course, plays right into Vladimir uh, Lenin's uh, hands, right? Because he, as the leader of the Bolsheviks, is going to promise the army an end of the war. He's going to promise the people a redistribution of land, right? So uh, on November 6th, in what becomes known as the October Revolution, and it's because they're on different calendars and in, in, on the... Uh, uh, calendar they were using, it was October. On November 6th, Bolsheviks are going to overthrow the provisional government, and they're going to declare the establishment of a Soviet republic, right? And this is going to lead to a civil war in Russia uh, that's going to last for several years, and it's going to include having U.S. and Japanese and British forces actually helping trying to get the provisional government to stay in place. Uh, it it's no wonder that the uh, Soviets were immediately suspicious of the West from the very beginning, right? But Lenin is ultimately going to prevail, and he's also going to get Russia out of the war. On March 3rd, 1918, he is going to sign a, sign a treaty with uh, Germany called the Treaty of Brent Litvosk. Uh, it's going to give up a lot of land to Germany, but this treaty is not going to stand because it's actually going to be overturned later when the war end, ends because of the Treaty of Versailles. 